the most important thing is are you helping with some kind of motive or outcome in your mind or are you helping without any motive i caused a loss of over 10 million dollars for the company and i thought this is it it's finished right i'm gone i truly believe that big success comes through big failure and if you're not failing enough you're not you're being too safe and you're not going to be successful you're not trying hard enough yeah who you work for makes a bigger difference than where you work what you work on and what you're doing if the person speaks too good english in a country where english is not the language they are probably not the best people in the country so you're hiring wrong the two most important things in life which determine almost 99% of what will happen to you is who is your partner and which city do you choose to live in instead of telling people to you know fool hardly chase your dreams do what you love but i think no one or very few people tell you that backstop yourself how do you protect yourself from failure so arjun welcome to the barber shop uh, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to host you thank you so much for coming and you know you are a mentor to me um uh, in addition to being my board member and someone who helps drive the business of the larger team but uh, you are a you are someone who has genuinely been one of the most helpful people to me so to all our uh, viewers and listeners introducing arjun purkayas to you uh, and i let him do the honors but uh, um he and i got to know each other almost 3 years back and he's an investor a board member um and someone who runs a lot of things at reket who is an institutional investor at at bombay shaving company and bombay the purpose arjun of barber shop at its very core was <clears throat> to make entrepreneurship real and humanize it for the masses right entrepreneurship like we were talking today about access and close group it it remained a privilege of a few people of course mm. because of the risk profile of the job and so on right but because it become mainstream a lot of funding has happened india is going to create over the next 20 years more enterprises than they have created in, the, in their history right and we want our listeners and viewers who are interested in startups to either think about starting their own company or be a part of the ecosystem either through investing or joining as an employee and so on right so that's what we want to do there is a huge employment deficit gap in india we want to create a million jobs a month that's what we need to do to hit our goals we are at 1/4 of that today so that deficit is going to keep growing until the enterprises catch up right. and that won't happen till more people become entrepreneurs so that's the thesis of course the conversations as you know go yeah. all over the place but would love for you to kind of tell the viewers who you are what your journey has been and then we can get into the conversation yeah i i think first of all shantanu thanks a lot for having me here i think when i saw the first few episodes I would have never imagined that I would be sitting in the same <laughs> sofa uh, as uh, some of your very illustrious guests. So I think the pleasure is all mine. Uh, and if it doesn't work, feel free to edit out and de- delete <laughs> no, the whole episode if you want. Uh, uh, I mean, just just a quick introduction. I'll I'll make it very brief. I think you've given most of it anyway. Uh, uh, of course, I I help uh, Bombay Shaving Company as uh, uh, my company is invested in it and. I'm a board member and I've been working with you. I think even from before uh, before we invested because you know from the time we met till the time we invested that itself was a long journey. Long process, yeah. It was a long process and a long journey. Uh but a pleasurable one because I think we got to know each other and learn a lot about each other also COVID through that one. journey. Yeah. Also COVID yeah. wave one so it was like difficult times in the world in exactly. general. Exactly. Exactly. Uh So I I I I work at Racket that's my day job uh in uh, in London but I travel a lot. Or oh, pre covid and now sort of what you call post covid uh i i travel a lot because i work on uh, global businesses so i work on our global e-commerce uh, digital and venture capital business and then recently i have also taken on our greater china business uh but unfortunately given the situation there right now yeah. uh, it's next to impossible to get there uh but there's a great team on the ground working uh, on on uh, our business there so so that's that's the background i'm uh you know fully aligned to the mission and purpose that you have i really think that this is the decade of india uh and i think entrepreneurship is so vibrant uh and and you know the entrepreneurs we met today you know probably the subject of another episode which will come out uh but uh, the audacity with which they're looking at markets is just simply amazing and i think this is a sample of what's going on uh in the market so and and i think that what you are doing 
with this program is going to encourage many more people to come up and do it, to take the first step forward, to see there are people like me doing this. People need examples. And I think you're providing that to them. Plus also, you know, helping them learn many different aspects, which may not be directly connected, but I think conversations which, which go everywhere are also valuable to learn from, you never know what you can pick up. Uh, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm a big supporter, I'm a big believer. Uh, I love how some of the companies are coming up in India. Uh, love having an opportunity to help the founders to build brands. And I think one of the passions I also have is that I really want to see a lot of these companies succeed. Yeah. And not just succeed in India. And it's not about the small beating the big, but it's about really succeeding on a global stage. Because I think the time has come. Uh, and the time is now. And I think to anyone who's listening, this is the time to do it. Uh, yeah. You're not going to get all these things working together. Uh, and this is really a golden moment. So I think there's also some amount of FOMO that I'm not here and <laughs> doing that. But I would support in any which way, and which, which is why I say, you know, that's my day job. In, in my spare time, which is like a hobby or play for me, I, I like uh, helping uh, some of these companies and helping some of the founders and seeing, you know, whatever little way I can do. But obviously, help has to be sought also. It's not, it's not a uh, one-way street where you say, I'm going to help you and I can see how I'm going to help you. They, they need to know what help they need and, and stuff like that. But uh, I think that's sort of the background. Amazing. I think uh, one of the things that stands out for me, Arjun, about you is every Saturday morning over the last three, four months, um, I would get a message from you. And to our viewers, Arjun is five hours be behind India. So at 11 or 12 in the morning, India time, or maybe 1 o'clock, by, by the time I'm having lunch on a Saturday, I would get a photograph of, a, of your li laptop or your iPad with the barbershop episode going on, uh, your beautiful home in the background, uh, your feet on the table or something to show that it's you <laughs> watching and it's not just a photograph. But to be very honest, um, you would put down detailed feedback about what you learned from an episode, especially if it was season 1. In season 2, you we gravitated towards telling me about how do we make conversations richer? How uh, you know we can make founders more well prepared? How do equity seekers come across as better? But the entire approach to being helpful and generous, it is not easy to watch a two and a half hour episode and then have the energy to type it all out on a Saturday, which is when you probably are on holiday, spending time with your family and so on. But you invested that, which for me was very heart touching, like it was genuinely very moving. Plus it moved us in the right direction. So I wanted to come down to, is that something that you do generally? Is that how much of yourself you put into your relationships, professional and otherwise? Or was was it something special for the barbershop? <laughs> uh, this is like a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I can answer that, as yeah. honestly as you want. Yeah. So, so the first thing I'll say is that the content is addictive, right? So the content is really good. Uh, I, I think the numbers speak for itself. There are people watching and you know, completing the episodes and putting out one hour, two hour, and maybe two into two hour content uh, and having people have such high engagement and watch rates, uh, the numbers speak for themselves. So I am one of the people who are addicted to the show. It's a time for me to also get closer and keep myself grounded to what's happening in the startup ecosystem in India. And I think for a lot of people who are watching it in India also, who don't have access, it is a way for them to get connected to very successful founders and now also to people who are just starting out because I think the cohort of people you're speaking to is different. So I think content is very good to start off with first. Second, I want you to be successful. So I think um, what you're doing is extremely noble. Uh, I, I think it's a service to the, to the community. It's a service to people who don't know yet and who have not started up yet. And even if you can convert one person with every episode, it's worth this effort. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to just play my small part in it. And I think there I may have some expertise that I can lend or we can have a discussion together where I can say, hey, listen, these are, these are the good things which is working. But I think some of these things, you know, if you tweak this, you can get more engagement, you can get the right message out. Yeah. Uh, you can give, give a more balanced message uh, to people about what they're doing. So I think it's that. Third, I don't think it's work for me. I think that's, you know, that's the most important thing. This is not a job. It's one, it's a way to disconnect from everything that I do during the week. 
I also spend the Saturday morning time when everyone is relaxed and sleeping. I actually am a very early riser, yeah. so I get up very early. Everyone is sleeping, uh, so most of the time I would read a book or something. And this I would read a book a little bit and then you know say okay let's watch the episode. Uh, and then complete it, if I don't complete it on Saturday I'll watch half. If people wake up then it has to stop. <laughs> uh, and then I would watch it on Sunday and go through with it. But it's it's kind of like a it's got set into the routine uh, and uh, it's it's enjoyable right so it's, i don't, i won't you can call it entertainment and i won't label it as entertainment as such uh, but i think it's also learning so uh, if, there is just so much to learn in every episode you would pick up even if you pick up one or two two two, two three things in the one hour it's like really worth invested because you'd look at a problem from a different angle altogether or you would learn about a new business or you would learn about a new perspective especially with the guests that you had uh, so i think that's those are some of the drivers nothing more than that but do you um, and i've seen this not only in the context of barber shop but in the context of other founders that we co invest in hmm. um, or <clears throat> the other founders that you invested in institutionally or even the kind of relationships you have built with id and some hmm. of the other people who we know together that is something which is a hallmark of your relationships which is you go out of your way to invest time and intelligence into making the other person as successful as possible where does that come from is this conditioning or is this who you are or is someone taught you to do this or did someone do this for you uh, where you feel that you know this is like you feel like giving back and you do it very naturally now yeah i i think maybe all of the above in some way or the other okay. uh, i think you know first of all to acknowledge we are always the sum of everyone who invested in us who didn't need to uh, over time so you know there are some people who who need to or want to uh, out of desire and uh, i don't think it's an entitlement but uh, you know th- those would naturally be your parents and your very closest friends and things like that uh, and you know that makes us who we are to a large extent but i think that some of you know the top spin or the top up or things that you would not get which is not your base conditioning and your values you learn some of these things from people on your journey along the way yeah and throughout throughout the journey there have been so many people who've not needed to help or who've not needed to do anything or you know you're somewhere and you do a meeting and someone comes to you by the side and says hey you know you did this thing maybe if you did it this way you would you would be able to come to a better outcome and that could be like a game changing moment for you yeah. and and over time you see lots of people bosses mentors people invest in you uh, so i think part of it is is a conditioning that you know they did it and i am here today because of you know what they gave me and how do you give back uh, then i think also that i don't like breadth of relationships and that's probably because i am actually an introvert on the complete end of the spectrum really yeah on the complete that end of the spectrum that is so difficult to make out yeah so and then it's trained over time to not be like that in settings uh, and you train yourself over time and you learn over time that you know what are the things you can do but how do you know you're an introvert or an extrovert that you know if you're with a lot of people when you finish are you exhausted or you're not exhausted yeah and do you, you? do you get i i get exhausted today has been difficult today is difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so it's exhausting but uh, you need to pull yourself and and move move ahead so but depth of a relationship gives me energy yeah. so if it's yeah. it's one on one or if it's a few people and we can go deep mm. that gives me energy so i i i figured that out at some point of time that this gives energy and therefore it's something that you enjoy doing and again it's it's not work it's not it's not something that you have to do but it it, it gives you energy so there is some selfish need also in that for yourself yeah uh, that you're doing uh, and then if you can help why will you not help yeah uh, i think uh, that's that's also uh, that's also that's part of it that's a very rare view of the world by the way people typically will hold their cards close to their chest shorten florida is kind of very very common right uh, you in fact are waiting for people to fail or for i told you so moments but to genuinely wait for other people to succeed you know in your case with founders become billionaires uh, or kind of become ceos etc it requires a very special mindset to selflessly help i remember our common friend lakshman once told um, uh, once told me 
uh, about <clears throat> a concept called sponsorship and he said that with certain people he said look i don't think i can do any help or even mentorship right my only job is to be a sponsor which is i am responsible for their success in a tangible way my only job is to thumb the table in rooms that were, that are relevant to them um uh, to connect them to people who they can get funded by or can get a job opportunities or whatever and i am only measured by how successful they become because of my interventions not how much they learn from me mm. how much i can do anything for them otherwise just to be successful and i think that's an amazing way to measure ki am i kind of am i kind of um sponsoring people the way you do hmm. and but tell me a little bit more about the people who did it for you who did not need to and wha- like what 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 about your relationship with them crystallize that mentorship uh, and that sponsorship in your case ah oh, that's a very interesting one i'll have to really there, there are just so many of them maybe one or two that come but, to but, mind you know i don't want to take one or two names and then leave the others out it <laughs> no, feels it's okay it's it, it feels uh it feels really bad i i i, I let me just uh, uh but, but before that i just want to talk about a different aspect so yeah. i think that's a very tangible way and I, i also think everyone has their own way of helping yeah. so i i think there is no one formula of this is the only way to help people mm-hmm. or uh, uh, that that you uh, get to i think pay it forward is a great way uh, and i think a lot of the a lot of the help you do the most important thing is are you helping with some kind of motive or outcome in your mind or are you helping without any motive uh, you know the, the chinese have a concept called guangxi uh, you know which is about helping each other and therefore build, it's very similar i can't find an equivalent word for it in english but it's how you would build an ecosystem together or how you would invest in each other and how you would grow with each other without expecting what will happen you know something good will happen but you don't know what will happen as an outcome of it especially for yourself especially for yourself especially for yourself or especially for your company or for your institution but you know that something good will happen because you know you are doing things for each other and it's not you don't keep score so you don't keep a score that i did him two favors and i did her three favors now she owes me three he owes me two type of thing nothing like that uh, you just help each other and and you keep moving on on with it so uh, i mean i can come up with let's say the simplest example stranger right we are traveling in japan uh, my wife and i it's late at night we decide to be adventurous we have a japan rail pass we land up in some town i don't even remember the name and everything is in japanese we have no way to get out of it uh, we don't know which train to board or what to do and it's dark at night 11 o'clock all we know is that we've we've taken this japan rail pass and we need to get back to kobe which is an other city somewhere else where a friend of ours is staying because you know uh, we are like bootstrap backpacking type of scene we couldn't even afford a hotel except once we blew the money on the jr rail pass it's finished right you can't do anything else and we are just standing there we have no idea what to do and uh, of course a japanese person comes up to us huh. and uh, he can't speak english Uh, and this is like way back in the day was there google on your phone or there's something? no phone man this was this was when there was no smartphone so oh, wow. so this is like way back in the day i'm showing my age also by saying all this but <laughs> it's like way back in the day there's no smartphone huh. uh, you had the button nokia phones at that point of time and uh, you're stuck there and this guy turns up to you and he knows that something is wrong because people in japan can feel it and read it in the air they have this this saying that in japan you have to know how to read the air and he can read the air that we are worried and we are really nervous because we don't know how we're going to get back this guy pulls out a calculator looking thing from his pocket and wondering what is this guy going to do and he opens this calculator thing and he starts typing in japanese and this thing started translating in english so it was a little pocket translator that this guy had oh wow yeah, like yeah. A, like a device like a device this guy was a passenger and uh, he somehow got from us because we would say it in english and it would translate back into japanese to him uh and he figured out we wanted to go to the city wow and uh one train came and went uh he said no not on this one wait he got us onto the right train and he stood and watched us go later on i realized from some friends some japanese friends he missed his train so the first train was his train which he was waiting for to let us go now he didn't need to do that that's insane we were strange people in a strange land 
and uh, he helped us. God knows what would have happened because my instinct would have been get into the first train because the train is going in that direction, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> I don't know what misadventure we would have had at yeah. the end of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything was fine and it worked. So, it's just a simple kindness of a stranger. Uh, and this, this you find happens again and again and again. Because I think people have, on the whole, more good in them. And they, they would show it if, if you are willing to accept it. accept it and take it. And see, if you're in a strange country and a stranger comes to you, what you've probably been taught, and I've, pro and I've probably been taught also that don't speak to strangers yeah. when we are kids. So you would say like, is this guy, you're in a strange country, right? Is this guy going to mug me? Is he going to take away my money? Is he going to do something to me? Uh, you could react two ways. Yeah. And if you react as in, in a positive way to a fellow human being, they will respond in a positive way most of the times. Yeah. I've seen that nine times out of ten. So, wow. and of course there is the odd case, you know, something will go wrong, you'll be gullible, etc, etc. But uh, it's the opposite of startup investing. So in startup investing, if you if you uh, if you go into a company at the very early stage where there's no one else and you're the first check, nine out of ten, ten times you'll fail. Yeah. In this, the odds are completely the opposite. Nine out of ten times, someone will help you. Yeah. One out of ten times, someone will cheat you. Yeah. It's an odd word taking. Uh, so 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 I think that's just happened over a period of time. Bosses who've helped you, who spend time to you to time with you to coach you, even though they don't need to coach you in something. Uh, people who don't have anything to do with you or they're just friends, they sit down and say, hey, listen, I can help you. So this happens so many times in life again and again uh, over a period of time. And I think just the world is a better place if you, if everyone is helping each other. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I completely agree. But tell me, if I, I'm going to kind of probe on the one or two examples of places where someone has meaningfully done, not li life changing is a big bar, but like today, for example, Tabre said, right, hmm. that I was in a job which was a dead end job. Yeah. And my boss told me that if you're doing something which you're not enjoying and someone else can do it, then you're in the wrong job. Hmm. And he said that changed my life. And it's amazing that that same boss is today his co-founder and they're building something together. Hmm. But that one sentence meant so much to him. But can you can you recount some moments which kind of which stayed with you from a mentorship standpoint or people who kind of backed you early on in your career hmm. or through your career actually. Yeah, I'll, I can give you a boss story since oh. we're at it, right? So, you know Addy as well. Uh, many years he ago. He me just yesterday. Yeah. See, and think about this, the guy is so senior. He, I mean, he can call me up and I will be sleeping and I will get up and stand in attention and take his call for one <laughs> hour if he wants to talk to me, right? That's the, and that's fine. He's earned hmm. it because Addy is so much senior to me that yeah. I will do it because that's just who he is. And what I feel for him. But he's like, can I take one hour of your time on Zoom over the next one to three weeks to share my idea with you? And I'm like, Addy, come on. Like, I will, <laughs> of course, like, I was so, it was so embarrassingly humbling to me. But hmm. that's the kind of guy he is. So I yeah. just absolutely adore him. Yeah. But anyway, you guys share a special relationship. So tell me more. Yeah. So um, I had, um, you know, at that point of time, I had left my, uh, I'd left my, uh, Pretty good going career at PNG and joined uh, Racket in Korea. In Korea. In Korea, and uh, it what happened to me after I went there was like a series of unfortunate events. Uh, so I failed again and again for six quarters. Uh, okay. Complete disaster, right? I was a complete disaster. What were you doing there? I was the marketing director, but by the time I left, and I had my greatest learning there as well. Uh, by the time I left there. I had changed myself to e-commerce and marketing director and that's how I landed up in e-commerce eventually. Uh, but at that point of time, I, I, neither did I know any of this, neither did Addy know any of this. Addy was, uh, Addy was my one-up manager. He was based in China and uh, we were part of the same region, Northeast Asia. And I had had, a sp out of all the six quarters, I probably had the most spectacularly bad quarter of my life till today, till today. And in that quarter, uh, I hope you never go through it in Bombay Shaving Company, we did a consumer product recall. Wow. That's the toughest thing to do, by the way. You have to go to the, you have to get the product back from the houses of consumers. Because it was a, there was a hygiene, it was a like a... Whatever. It was, uh, it's a very long story. Huh. Uh, it, it was a technicality, so there was no consumer safety issue. But it was, there was a product recall which had to happen, okay. which is very difficult. And also, besides that, the business not going well, etc., etc., etc. Which year was this, if you don't mind me asking? 
मे बी इट वॉज थर्टीन ओके अराउंड थर्टीन एंड आई आई वॉन्ट गिव यू द एग्जैक्ट नंबर बट आई लॉस्ट यू कैन से द टीम लॉस्ट आई लॉस बट आई टेक द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी I caused a loss of over 10 million dollars for the company. And I thought this is it, it's finished, right? I'm gone. And then uh and and it was just early days in the company. And then Addy goes on stage and you know he's he's talking about what happened in the business and all and then suddenly he points out and says that um you know this guy Arjun uh he's lost this amount of money for the company. What do you think we should do with this guy? <laughs> so you know it was the shock of a lifetime for me i was like my god is this going to happen publicly <laughs> like in front of all the direct because anyway i already imagined the worst so i'm like uh, you know something uh, and you know and it was like and because of him you're not getting your bonus etc so i said okay now the crowd is going to lynch me uh, at the end of this thing and um, i think what he said next is like the moment that that founder had so he says some of you would say that we should fire him but i think that's absolutely the worst thing we can do do you know why so everyone was like first of all no one expected it so everyone <laughs> is like why like what what is this guy talk that guy is crazy but this guy is even more crazy so he says you know people say that we are not a training company or we don't invest money in training people at senior levels uh but i just i just sponsored the most expensive executive mba in, in this company's history and you think that i am going to let the person go out in attrition because after learning right? after learning after learning how to fail wow. and i didn't know what to say so i think at at that point of time i realized the power of the learning that comes from failure and of course you know like like you say immediately i felt huge debt so i was like oh my god now i owe yeah so much debt and my at that time i was doing e-commerce so in my mind i immediately said if i have to give a roas of 3 on this <laughs> oh my god that's a lot of money yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i made a mental note that i have to give the roas uh, at some point of time so i have a debt which i need to pay back it was also positioned as an executive mba that the company paid for so i said i have to make sure that i repay this debt some day but i think that just completely changed my perspective on failure and before that i think i was pr- probably near you know some kind of depression that you know failing so many times again i had not experienced that kind of failure so the sentence if it, if the sentence was different or you know if i got fired or lynched or something like that i would be completely broken today so and and that was one of the greatest favors that could have happened at that point of time and then you know came back the story ends very well we turned around the business because we pivoted from a you know being an offline company into an online company you we grew double digit everything happened a few years later I was working in another assignment and i did deliver the 3x roas and which was unexpected roas in the year uh and i think a lot of the learning came from that executive mba uh which was called and i still you know remember that i met adi and i told him i said you know the debt is settled uh, i have paid for my executive mba so now we are quits and we are zero and uh, you know adi being adi he just laughed at it <laughs> and he said yeah 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 you know i was joking and type of a thing uh, but uh, but but this would be like you know one of the moments and you know when you had moments like this in your life and in your career which are so meaningful to you which are really turning points i completely view failure completely differently now and uh, you know there's a saying like in my team i keep telling people uh, what, you know what does fail stand for first attempt in learning that's what fail is so you need to fail and the the more you fail the more you'll succeed in the long term uh, because failure teaches you lessons that success doesn't teach you because success teaches you an ego lesson that you're so great it's because of me that's you know that's the final lesson of every success everyone believes it's 100% me when you succeed uh and when you fail uh, oh, people believe oh i had bad luck or my bad luck was very bad mm-hmm. or he did this and she did that and if this is not happened and that had not happened nobody says when they are successful very few people i've seen who says that i only succeeded because you know it was mostly luck or whatever or it's a humble brag or something like that uh but i truly believe that big success comes through big failure 
and and continuous iteration and failing again and again and if you're not failing enough you're not you're being too safe and you're not going to be successful you're no, not trying hard enough yeah i remember very clearly my first learning at mckinsey um i was 24 years old and we were doing coal procurement uh, in jharsuguda hmm. this is not small okay this 2 lakh tons of coal a month and i was the only associate on that work stream there were four other associates in other parts of the plant but procurement i was doing and i took some bad calls hmm. like i i decided to buy 20000 tons from a particular mine at a time when the mine plan showed hmm. that the there would be rains hmm. so the coal that was coming out was wetter uh and then there was a couple of auction calls like it's a mm. it's a sell side auction right couple of the auction calls in terms of bids i bid a lot more than the other contemporaries i paid mm. my marginal cost per per gcv was much higher and company went into loss and this is not even my company this is mm. my client right and i am representing the firm and i am 24 years old and it's my first job and i don't want to lose it and anubhav agarwal who's the founder of rev was my manager and is a hardcore guy okay like one of the most badass human beings you would meet from a problem solving and intelligence standpoint i was like this guy is going to come on thursday and he is going to screw me and he came and we he we used to charter we used to charter flights in from bhubaneswar or from ranchi hmm. uh, raipur into jharsuguda so i like kabar i kept looking at the phone at the, at the, at the blackberries right hmm. when the charter coming his charter landed like he's half an hour away from here and we had exchanged by blackberry messengers he like i said itna hmm. loss hai the other three mistakes hmm. and he said his only response to that was two exclamations question mark and exclamation <laughs> that was the message i'd got from him <laughs> so i was like oh god he's going to be so pissed off so he came to the plant and i was sitting in the in the team room and he came in and he saw me trembling and um, he took me to the side and he said come let's go for a smoke mm. so when for a smoke <clears throat> and i told him he like kya hua then he went first thing he did was understood the situation So he put himself in my shoes and said, "Why did you take the calls you took? Hmm. I want to not questioning to see to to evaluate my competence. Hmm. Questioning to empathize my situation, which are two very right. different ways, yeah. right? But he did the latter, and then he I said, hey, okay, understood, understood, makes sense. Samleshwari, I mean, itna mind plan tha, so okay, Mangali, it's a it's a bet that went wrong. Hmm. Anyone could have made it." and auction bids okay we if hmm. the flip side was if you didn't get the coal because hmm. there was a supply side issue the the boilers would have to stay empty so you de-risked the business of course it went wrong and it's fine and i said okay i, I said now how how are you going to punish me what was hmm. the look on my face <laughs> you what is my punishment yeah and you said what punishment nothing like there is no mistake you will make that i will not be able to explain and protect as long as you do it with the right intent yeah and i was like that is amazing because after that i just felt confidence over a very different yeah. level i never felt alone i never felt i always felt this guy had my back and if those things went down between the client or his bosses like they were scary partners in mckinsey at that yeah. time or maybe i was too young so yeah. i used to i used to feel that these are going to eat yeah. me alive but between me and them there's going to be anupam yeah. and i didn't ever question that and i did very well so for me mentorship is always about not mentorship but kind of being a great boss was always about giving freedom like you know kind of absorbing the pressure and releasing the empowerment yeah as opposed to some bosses who kiss up and kick down yeah. which is some of the worst like they're the kind of more insecure yeah self you know selfish kind of bosses but some of them are just amazing and that's the kind of mentors i've had yeah. but your and adi's relationship has evolved into something very beautiful over the last Yeah. 10 years or so you kind of went did a lot of work together i mean even till today we are great friends uh-huh. uh you know just like your friends with your former bosses as yeah. well uh, i think these relationships go way beyond work uh but uh, I, i think uh, just coming back to some of the points you said like bets right everything is a bet yeah and sometimes the bet goes right and you do very well and sometimes a bet goes wrong and and i think it's really important for people to realize that that anything can go wrong uh, even if there's a small probability of 1% it can go wrong and as long as you had the right ah. intent and the right backstop and you took the risk in a right way uh, it's there and then there's nothing like knowing that you have a boss who has your back right yeah that that i think i've seen it you know all of us have our share of best bosses and worst bosses yeah. and good bosses and bad bosses but i think what always sets the best boss 
there are many many things but if the boss doesn't have your back they have no chance to fall into the best boss or good boss bracket you know okay. that's that's like a go no go criteria it's it's a make it or break it uh, type of a thing other thing on bosses the this is i think my conclusion and it could be wrong and maybe it works only for me uh, but i i see a lot of people uh, also saying it that in the workplace the single most important thing more important than anything else and i would give it a weightage of 90 plus your happiness at work and happiness with what you do is completely correlated with who your boss is and what is the relationship you have with her or him and wow and you can go back and look at any role you've done in your life even as a founder maybe your boss is the board if you have a great board yeah. uh, you know who support you and who egg you on and if you have a bad board you would end up in a bad situation but who you work for assuming that you know you and even if you are actually uh doing something uh you know if you're a bank robber or whatever even then who you work for <laughs> who you work for is the single most important thing it's the single most important driver of everything you do and this is something that people don't believe they can do but and sometimes you have a choice and sometimes you don't have a choice but if you can always choose your boss yeah yeah if you if you can choose your boss i would always like yeah of course there's institution and company and things like that and of course in big companies they want you to feel that the company is there and the company is greater than individual for sure uh but who you work for makes a bigger difference than where you work what you work on and what you're doing yeah and that is the single biggest driver so i always try to figure out how can you optimize for that and how can you land up in that situation yeah uh and if anyone asks me for advice i always I always say that try and figure out who you want to work for Uh, yeah. because that will make the single or then the next the next double click on that is what you do does it have purpose do you yeah. really enjoy it and then who do you work with yeah. do you love who you work with yeah and i think if you solve three of these you solve most of your work problems in life and then it's a question of can you extract value and you know all the all, all the other yeah. stuff but that's never the answer no one no one leaves no one leaves let's say bombay shaving company or or the company i work for for 10% extra money I agree. No one ever leaves for ten percent or fifteen percent or even fifty. Yeah, I agree. even fifty. People don't leave even when they get hundred percent extra money because yeah. they want to continue working with the team and the boss and what they're doing. Yeah. So uh, whenever people say it's you know it's a percentage extra problem, it's never that. That's that is always the first easiest excuse to give. Wow. One of the things you're right. Like for example, having your back is one, but it. it manifests in multiple ways one of the ways i have consistently seen great managers or leaders do it uh, is they they i don't i don't know whether it's a training thing or whether it's just naturally who they are as people they always practice admonish in private praise in public yeah. and it's beautiful to watch yeah. for example um <clears throat> if i'm with deepak's team right and deepak works with them every day and i probably see them once in a while or maybe once a week and if something is not as per my satisfaction and if i go to deepak's subordinate or their subordinate and say this is not right or you know this doesn't make any sense i don't like this blah 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 it happens subconsciously i'm looking at deepak hmm. to protect hmm. and he does right <clears throat> and that's the sign of a soft someone who say hey shantanu hold on yeah here's what i think has happened okay and here are the three things by the way i disagree with you on point number a hmm. there's i don't think i think that that's an overreach hmm. on points b and c agree but here here's the explanation here's how we're going to correct it yeah bro if deepak looks at them and asks two questions in addition to what i'm asking i'm like okay hold on a second yeah now you are you're riding the the wave and and shirking responsibility but great leaders never do that they kind of always yeah and then i will notice that he will kind of when when i have left the room the admonishment is in very private yeah right and that's i remember <clears throat> i don't know whether you know vinod nambiar no. the ceo at more retail okay. he was a guy who signed the shareholders agreement for us at colgate in our first colgate round so he was the asia ceo okay uh, what mukul is right now and after that he went on a sabbatical and spent some time with us in delhi in mm. person so at that time he used to tell us a lot of these 
you know he was mm. on a one year sabbatical he had some time we were a young 2018 a young company um and he would kind of share with us mm. some of these some of these things and he told us this one thing that make sure your managers are admonishing in private and praising in public and yeah. not the other way around because then it's a problem it's super If, important yeah and i was like that's 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 good. what 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 else have you seen good bosses really really do really well which is it's hard to be a good boss man mm. it's easy to take responsibility and say hey i'll delegate and i'll make people happy and i'll make them have fun but when when rubber hits the road mm. and there are numbers to be met and you work in an organization yeah. that is brutally focused on on numbers and achievement and targets then then it's not easy to be a good guy mm. in fact it's very hard to be a good popular person all the time in fact yeah. rarely if, if at all yeah so um you you know this uh, this is a single example that you gave like a one on one example right I, i'll give you a expanded version of it Sure. The expanded version of it is uh, that when the team is down, and when that it could be an individual, but also I think being a good boss is also about the whole team, not just an individual. But yeah. when the team is down, you actually pick them up and lift them up and encourage them, and you're full of positivity. and it's actually the opposite but it's damn hard to be because it's the hard team is be. down for a reason yeah. and then so so are you but it's right? the opposite it's the opposite of what you're taught all your life to do it's the opposite of what you're taught all your life to do but when the team is up and winning you don't do that really you don't do that so you say great but why didn't this happen or great but what about this gap so you set exceedingly high standards for a high performing team so that they can perform and perform because that's what they need you don't want a high performing team to become complacent. complacent yeah so so you need to push the boundaries and stretch it like a rubber band and that's not what you're taught to do you're taught to say great job fantastic market shares up everything is great let's have a party you have the party but you get back and say okay now we need to double the sales yeah. it's a simple is gravity right it's gravity so if the team is up and soaring you need to give them more runway to fly yeah if the team is down the default is to go more down and more down and more down you have to pick them up that's your job as a boss so how do you pick them up when they are down when when they are the most difficult and i think that's that's also one of the things like you're saying what are some of the things this is definitely one of the things that i've seen good bosses do or good leaders do uh with organizations amazing amazing Tell me, tell, tell me. I, I'm going to ask you a slightly vague question because mm. we've had this discussion over lunch in London, mm. and kind of moving from mentorship and bosses to, to kind of a more broader theme of 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 being a business leader. Um, and I, I remember the zero to one, one to ten, the mm. Hoffman example. But uh, you're someone who's kind of taken on multiple roles in multiple geographies. increasing scope of influence hmm. and now with your latest uh, you know greater china hmm. uh, responsibility you handle a, a massive business right um and what do you think are your tenets of being a great leader in a business context like what differentiates the good from the great from a business leadership standpoint I know it's a very vague question, yeah. and I'm, I'm I'm aware <laughs> that you know it kind of will kind of be. But if you were to think about what you do well, um, and maybe better than anyone else, what 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 would those things be? Number one rule: hire people who are better than you. And I think again, that's another difficult thing to do. Yeah. Because you are trained to, or the mind has something that you you say if they're better than me, then they should be above me, or they should be at my seat. uh but uh, you need to do two things simultaneously you need to make your boss redundant yeah and you need to hire people who make you redundant and that's the only way you know you can move on to the next thing or do more and more things so hire people who are better than you and there are many tenets to this so i can uh, you know go through many many different ways of you know what are some of the heuristics you use how you work on it but the key is hire people who are better than you and set them free and don't micromanage them and coming back to the first thing we talked about you know which is about you keep setting the standards high um very early like when i was a brand manager i learned about this concept called the pigmalion effect have you heard of it no same or p 
people will do exactly what you expect them to do. So if you set the expectation unreasonably high, they will deliver unreasonably high. If you set the expectation as, you know, you are only capable of this, you will get exactly that or maybe slightly more. Maybe the person will have fire in the belly, so they'll do 3% more than and say that, you know, I proved you wrong. You have to take a bet on people. Get good people. Be sure that they're good people. Be sure that they're better than you. Have the guts to employ people who are better than you. Set them free. Give them all the resources. Tell them this line which, you know, I'm going to share with you and I know too many people will know it, but it's fine. Maybe it's better for the world. That there is no idea in the world, if it's a good idea, that you can't find the money for. There is no idea in the world. Because if it's a good idea, capital will come to it. And set them free to do, do what they're good at. And encourage them and work with them. Help them where help is needed. And then build an ecosystem like that. That's how you can do many things. You can't do many things if, if you are doing everything. You can only do many things if there are other people doing many things. But you have, they have, have to want to do it. You have to get the best out of them. It has to be in their purpose. You need to find a way of connecting their purpose to what they're doing. And you have to make it easy. And, and then you just have to repeat it again and again and again. So it's not, it's not a formula, but I think everyone comes to something at some point of time uh, and gets there. So I would say, you know, this may be one aspect. There are many aspects of it, of course. But this would definitely be one aspect of it. I want to ask you two questions on this. One is... When, and I've heard this, hmm. and you've told me this multiple times, hire people better than you. But I wanted to ask you, define better than you, like in what way? How, how, how would you judge that or for that role or how would you say someone's better than me? I think when you feel uncomfortable that they know something more than you, or you ask them about some problems and say, how would you solve this? Or if you see the, it would be a different approach to you. So if you hire a clone of yourself, the chances yeah. are they are a younger version. So this is this is like a disease which almost everyone has. That you tend to hire younger versions of yourself. Yeah. And if you hire a younger version of yourself, they will definitely... They may get better than you someday, but they're not better than you then. So I think first of all is mastery or domain knowledge. Yeah. Are they better than you to do that job? Do they know more than you? Uh, and if they don't, you have to seek out. So for example, when do you hire external or when do you hire internal? So internal, if you can find a person with the skills which is better than you, and a lot of times, let's say in new age businesses or if you're building a company, you may not have that person inside the company, but you have to have a clear filter that if it is about better leadership, you can teach better leadership in your company. You can teach the people to grow up and become great leaders in this company as you build Bombay Shaving Company into an institution. But there are some technical skills which cannot be replaced. Yeah. And you need to get them from outside. Supposing you want to pivot to becoming more of a tech company, having an app ecosystem, whatever, build a services business out. You need to hire a person who knows how to do yeah. that. And that person is going to, by definition, be better than you. Wow. So, so you need to find these people and get them to work so in that your person team. is able to make you intellectually insecure in the, in, in the field yeah. of that yeah. role. Wow. The, uh, the other, uh, sometimes you, you don't get the opportunity to do this. You're also building a team. So it's not about this person being better. So there are many, there are many variables that you're solving for at the same time. Yeah. Another variable you're solving for is, let's say you have a team of 10 people. One person goes, gets promoted or goes to another company, becomes a CEO somewhere else. How are you going to put, what is the criteria? If you had only one criteria, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. How would you choose the new 10th person? If someone leaves? Yeah. Or they get promoted, whatever. Let's say they leave on a positive note yeah. for, for whatever reason. Yeah. How would you replace that person? Personally? Hmm. I genuinely wait to see if naturally, organically, there is someone in the team who takes the responsibility and fills the role. Hmm. Because typically, you feel that if someone has left or gotten promoted, or for whatever, if there's a yeah. vacancy, that <clears throat> there is a temptation to quickly fill that vacancy. Hmm. You know, put a job description out, get your headhunters on board, yeah. find the five people, interview, blah, 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 fill the vacancy. 
what we don't realize is that vacancies are like black holes and black holes have massive gravity hmm. and gravity works two ways one is either it pulls senior people into doing that job hmm. or it pulls junior people up into doing like they kind of start yeah. punching about their weight if gravity of that vacancy is pulling someone here and someone here is going to get pulled up yeah. naturally because they are more capable they are yeah. you know they are someone who is kind of aspiring for that role it could be an ambitious human being it could hmm. be a you know one of those people and i have i start wait i wait for maybe 3 to 6 weeks to see hmm. if someone is getting pulled into this and if that is happening then i kind of step in or i'll ask someone else okay, this person seems to be seems to be filling those shoes hmm. quickly ask them if they want to do we think that that person has the has has the gumption and the com- competence to do it hmm. and if the answer to those two questions is yes then we quickly we don't hire we quickly move that person and make the team work and maybe okay. <clears throat> give 3 to 6 months of coaching mm-hmm. you know uh, apprenticeship etc so that it's not you know flapping in the deep end of the pool for too long mm. but if that gravity is pulling senior people down mm. then we hire quickly so okay. that's the way we think about okay. it okay i'll add another one to it huh. that the person you hire for that 10th role it becomes super critical because that's going to either drive your culture up or down it won't stay flat that's for sure correct how do you choose a person whether internal you know whether getting sucked up sucked down whatever way you see it whose addition will make the team a better team than it was when the earlier 10th member was in the team yeah that is the key filter and it can be a it can be a very junior person it can be a person you take a bet on but it's not just about that person being right about right for the job it is did the whole team get better as a result of hiring that person and wow. that's how you take the high performing team to the next level to the next level to the next level so average, average up av- you have to av- the team is the average of the 10 people yeah they may have different weights and you know it's not a mathematical formula it's human beings at the end of the day but you have to be super conscious of making sure that that person makes the team better than the last person did wow and i want to ask you a second question on the initial hiring people better than you but right you make it sound easy because i think you do it naturally which is to hire people better than you at their roles hmm. give them empowerment and then make sure that they have all the resources they need whether it's their own teams they have money time etc to do it my question to you is slightly more deeper which is <clears throat> if you know that they are better than you it is very likely that they also know that they are better than you at that role how do you role model for them when both of you are of are are clear that they may be better than you but you are the leader so how hmm. do you role model how do you become aspirational slash inspirational for these people who are in your team because hmm. it's not just about the hire you can get yeah. the hire and you may even get the first 6 months of wins and so yeah. on but how do you make it a 3 month 3 year 6 year kind of long term yeah. relationship where you role model and they look up to you hmm. even though they may be better i think first of all they don't need to look up to you oh, really why, why should they have to look up to you they have to work well with you okay. you have to be a team together so uh, i view every relationship as a batman and robin relationship okay you know like if you see batman and robin mm. they have very different skills uh they don't have the same skills actually they have completely different they even dress completely differently right correct That's right so they couldn't be two two superheroes much more far far apart and one may be designated as a senior and one may be designated as a junior but when they are doing their their stuff there is no hierarchy as such in the way they work that is very interesting and you must always look at it as a batman and robin team that you have a certain skill which you are much better than me mm-hmm. at my job is to unleash you on that i may have a better skill and if it's an external hire i understand the company better so i can help you navigate this place uh or i can coach you on certain things or etc you have to find a way but again coming back to chinese philosophy it's yin and yang right how do two different things work together in a complementary way to come to a more harmonious better outcome yeah and i think that's the way we, you need to view every relationship and that's why it's again so important not to hire junior clones of yourself Yeah. That's the worst possible thing you can do in life actually. The complementarity. Yeah, you can hire gone. them for some other role, yeah. but it shouldn't be clone clone clone. You you'll be building a clone army. And that's one of the mistakes that, you know, a lot of managers make, a lot of companies make. I have certainly made this in the past in my career as well. 
I am not going to name names, so don't ask. <laughs> right? So, uh, but, but coming back to this, how do you build this Batman and Robin relationship? Huh. How do you give them a platform where together you can achieve much more than alone you were? Because if you hire a person who you have to keep teaching everything and, uh, you know, you are essentially doing the same thing, then you, you just become a super version of that person and you don't want to be the, a super version of that person. You want to have a 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 effect and that's, you know, that has to be curated. It, you know, it comes with doing it again and again, but if you keep these things front of mind, you'll, you learn this over time. That's very interesting. But I think it's not easy to work with people who are very different from you. Hmm. Like, you have worked in different geographies. So, at least from a cult cultural standpoint, you have become comfortable with people who are different. Hmm. I have fundamentally, personally, found it difficult to work with people who are very different from me on certain aspects, right? Hmm. So, in terms of life morals, right? Hmm. Um, if they're very different, I find it hard to kind of relate. Um, I find it very difficult to, if we don't have common languages hmm. to kind of engage. I find it very, like I have had colleagues from different parts of the world, especially in the McKinsey context where English also was very broken, hmm. right? So we had to kind of, the translation thing, hmm. but in a colleague level was very difficult to do. So hmm. <clears throat> without shared context, it became very hard. How do you do that? Like, because if you yeah. are going to hire people who are different from you by design, hmm. then you are going to reduce shared context slash shared similarities in any yeah. way. And without that, how do you develop comfort? And especially if it's a non-hierarchical situation, as you're calling yeah. it, like kind of in that way. Let's talk about language, right? Since huh. you brought it up. Huh. So I go to a strange country. Huh. I don't speak the language. And as an expat leader in that country, what is your tendency? You hire people who can speak good English. That's the first thing all expat people do. That's the first context that they're looking for. Or you went to a, if you went to a certain type of university, did they go to that type of university? Or if you are an MBA, you tend to hire MBAs, ah. right? After lots of error, let me put it that way, and it came through failure, that if the person speaks too good English in a country where English is not the language, they are probably not the best people in the country. So you're hiring wrong. Are you serious? Yeah, you're hiring wrong. Because the business language is not English. The business language is the local language of the country. The consumer's language is the local language. The customer's language is the local language. No one speaks English. So why are you hiring English people just because you can understand them better? So there was a time, at least two of my direct reports, who could not speak English and I spoke to them through a translator. Okay. And I got much better outcomes than the 10th tenth, the tenth man syndrome which we talked about, who could speak English. They could do an average or above average job, but I, I made some hires who could not speak English no, no, and, no. and they turned out to be superstars. They completely changed the game. And you have to put your comfort aside. You have to ask, is it right for the team? Does the team get better? Can you get a better outcome? Are they better at the job? Why is language the way to do it? I know you can't communicate and, and it's diff, you, you know. It's friction, yeah. Of course, it's friction. But <clears throat> if you keep solving for your personal friction, then you're not a selfless manager. Yeah. You're not solving for the company and you're not solving for the outcome. So you have to solve for the outcome. And in many cases, what you think is right is wrong. And it doesn't work. So you need to ask yourself if the context is too high, therefore you, and everything is the same. Are you hiring a clone of yourself? Wow. And listen, I think sometimes you, you do need to have people who you have a common lingo with one or two or yeah. whatever, right? But it doesn't have to apply to every Everyone. single person in your company. Agreed. If you have one or two people, let's say you and Deepak, you know, you share that bond and you share the trust and you work together and your co-founders. It should be enough. Why should everyone have that with you? But have you seen how different we are? Yes. <laughs> we are yin and yeah. yang on steroids. Yeah. And, th and that's why it works. That's why it works. And that's why we can all see that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Have you seen, by the way, that your method for evaluating competence or excellence in people, um, like some of the things that you thought were right or important has kind of changed uh, over a period of time? It changes all the time. Yeah. Give me examples year, of when, when some year. of your basic assumptions in life were like tested. Because 
मेरे को लगता था कि ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है बट लुक एट दिस पर्सन एंड लुक एट दिस सिचुएशन एंड इट्स कंप्लीटली चेंज आई थिंक इफ आई इफ आई सी यू नो ओवर डेकेड द वे आई वॉज थिंकिंग ऑफ इट वेरी अर्ली ऑन इन माई करियर वॉज वेरी ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट दिस पर्सन इज गुड एंड विल मेक इट दिस पर्सन इज बैड एंड विल नॉट मेक इट यू नो दैट्स द फर्स्ट यू यू टेंड टू हैव सम काइंड ऑफ अ गट एंड एंड दैट्स हाउ यू स्टार्ट ऑफ विथ ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम you've learned to question your gut and say why are you asking that question what if you were wrong how do you look at it differently and a very important question to ask is that do you see something in this person that the person does not see in themselves today that if we start working together we can do or is this person capable of something but they are they are stuck doing something which is not them or they have a boss with whom the relationship is not good or they this in the wrong place or yeah. they are doing the wrong thing and if you are able to change one or two things will that work because everyone has you know every human being has some kind of infinite potential and you have to see the potential and of course you know they are scales and they vary and the time is right so so there are many things it's not that any person who turns up you can take them in and say okay now you have infinite potential and you can you can you can take any role you want sometimes you you can have the potential but you are 10 years of experience away from it uh but i think also you know the framework of uh very simple you you're good and you're not or you're a ghoda and you're not a ghoda which is actually what you know one of the professors taught me in uh, in college that you know when you go to work there'll be there'll be ghodas and there'll not be ghodas and your job is to spot the horses and run with them right but over time you realize other things are important and this evolved later on uh, you know it, at one point it's actually a meme but it's a fantastic meme on evaluating talent okay and of course in the corporate world you don't use uh. it but if you if you look at it there are two vectors uh, at work and i don't use this now but at one point of time i i, I have looked at it and from time to time i do look at it i'll i'll share with you what i would see now as as very important one axis is himmat courage one axis is okad which has no word in english and i'll leave it for you to figure out or you know you can put up a I, i'll send you the picture you can put it up on yeah. the side here somewhere yeah. left right wherever in, yeah. the, in the edit it gives you four titles yeah. uh, uh, uh which are fadu which is high himmat high okad high high ha huh. fadu ha huh. feku feku is Don't low <laughs> okay okay guess then we can feku you know. is low okad high himmat whatever ha huh. fuddu okay faltu anyway you want fadu people ha. basically <laughs> like so so you are optimizing for the correct. for the top box correct. right correct. and what you are looking for is so it's not it's not about labeling people you are this you are that you are you are this it's not at all about that it's just about if you if you are working with a person does the person have and you know in episode in season 2 what you are evaluating we keep saying conviction Yeah. Do you have conviction? But conviction is nothing but courage. Yeah. In some way, or it's a, it's one of the aspects of courage. Correct. Right. So, do you have courage? Do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your ideas? Do you go out there? You know, do you bat first? Do you protect your people? people. Uh, do you believe in them? So, all that is courage. So, yeah. do you have the courage to do big stuff? And then, okad very difficult to explain in English, but I'm sure most of the viewership understands the word Hindi. do they have the card <laughs> right because if you combine the two things yeah you have a deadly combination yeah and it's a meme so you can put up the meme and then people can look at it and laugh at it but it's a very you know uh, you know sometimes as they say art imitates reality and reality imitates art yeah sometimes meme the reason we connect with memes is because they actually That's really so true. true they are I so agree. true uh, and and this is true but this is not the last model you keep evolving it yeah uh yeah the, so, so what is the competence bit which yeah, is so let's call it the skill matrix or competence the competence enthusiasm integrity i yeah, probably don't have that so let's call one. it a competence skill matrix correct the other thing is luck so again someone told me this once i'd rather have a lucky general than have a general who's intellectually correct but never has luck 
Okay. So the question is, how do you seek luck? I'll ask you a question here before we go further because I'm going to put the spotlight completely on you now. Huh. How many people tell you or how many people may not have told you but they've told the editor and they may not have passed the message to you that the barber shop with Shantanu is a lucky break and that you got so much organic and everything, it's luck. Plenty. Plenty of people yeah. have told you? In general, barber shop and otherwise, people just think I'm a lucky guy. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? Why are you lucky? I'm kind of born, born to privilege. There's, there's you know, there's, I, I don't hmm. have to take the kind of risks people take. Right. Um, so, things generally fall my way. And these are small, small things, man. Like, I never lose something permanently. Right. Ever. It could be people also. Hmm. Like, there are relationships which I've been in and I'm amazing friends with them today. So, I don't hmm. lose people. I have wallet. I've left wallets and iPads on flights, in hotels, in far places. Someone will find it and hmm. courier it to me or I'll just find it. I've not lost something permanently. So, <clears throat> and generally, I'm damn good at multi-choice questions hmm. because luck will favor me. Okay. I will back my luck. And in college, people used to say this. Hmm. Hai, tukka se maar leta. Like, hmm. So generally, and then, what happens? It's a manifestation. Hota hai, le to. Ki, people believe I'm lucky. Hmm. So might as well take the shot. Hmm. Right? Or might as well take the... So hmm. now it kind of... I take more shots than the average person would hmm. and back myself and I have some validation for it. Ki, ki, iski hmm. se ho but I've never thought about it beyond that. Hmm. And if you had started this thing five years ago, would it have worked? Baba shop? Yeah. No. No, right? Okay. So that, <clears throat> that gives you some clue about the luck. So actually, you're right. You're lucky. And let's, let's shine, a, shine a light on that and figure out. Okay. There are actually four types of luck. And I think in, in a lot of, uh, I can say this because we know each other for, for enough time. A lot of times you have this, and uh, we talked even about it before, that, you know, I'm from a privileged background and that's why I'm lucky, etc. Yes, yes, you are. So type one luck uh, is what I call zip code luck. What zip code were you born in? Wow. Okay. Right. And, and you have, you have some of that. I also have. Some of that and, and I'm incredibly grateful for that because by the way, everything in life is at least 50% luck. Yeah. So if you're, if you're optimizing for comp competence and skill and etc, etc, uh, that's a great thing to do and you must do it. But you only optimize 50% of the equation. Yeah. The other 50% is luck. And one of the reasons we invested in you is because you're damn lucky. And let's talk about the second type of luck, right? All the type one luck, by the way. Yeah. You're right, one should be grateful about it. I have learned over a period of time to not be apologetic about it. That I used to earlier think that, okay, other people don't have it. Should yeah. I feel a certain sense of, you know, I have it, they don't, hmm. etc. But over a period of time, I've just learned, hey, yeah. ride it, make life better for people, good people around you. But don't apologize for being lucky on, on the zip code luck, as you call it. Yeah, me. it's the least important type of luck, by the way. <laughs> okay. If you're tr if you're setting out to do something big, yeah. or if you're if you're evaluating, it's actually the least. And zip code luck is this, as you said, I go to a foreign country, and the person who speaks English is the person whose parents could send them abroad for an education, and uh, you know, pay for an Ivy League education. The English became good, and they came back to the country. So, it is luck. It works in life, and it's fine, uh, and it's good. Uh, the second type of luck, and again we see it, and this came the first time uh, we met, is what, what is called hustle luck. Okay. Americans are fantastic at hustling. Uh, you know, that's if you want to learn how to hustle, you must go and work in the American ecosystem. Yeah. And hustling, part of it is networking, but part of it is just going out there, speaking to everyone, not having a preconceived notion that this person is good, that person is bad. Every conversation can lead to something. And you just put yourself out there and hustle and hustle. And if you stir the pot enough, you'll get lucky. Yeah. And that luck is taking enough shots at the target luck. So you take enough shots at the target luck. And we were talking about angel investing earlier. Yeah. Angel investing is an, in, is an incredibly lucky thing to do. So yeah. your zip code luck yeah. is your access luck. Yeah. You got access because you were born in a zip code. You went to a school. You went to a certain firm, etc., etc. You built a network. But then the other luck, you may have all that. And then you may have opportunities. Are you shooting at every opportunity yeah. that comes your way? And you create luck by doing that because anyway, at the end of the day, as I said, if you, if you 
you invest in 100 or 300 companies, you'll have five unicorns. Yeah. So that's luck. Yeah. The, the, if, if you knew what the five unicorns were, why would you invest in, in, in 295 the, others? In the 95 others Correct. more, right? So, Correct. So it is luck. You Correct. know, it is a game of luck. So you're playing that, you're increasing your odds, but it's a game of luck. That's what they say, right? When, you, when you're shooting arrows in the dark, shoot as many as you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, that is like the second type of luck. And you can name it hustle luck. I think yeah. that's, that's the simplest way to uh, sort of uh, put it out there. The third type of luck when you combine these two and you go to level 3 luck, huh. which has happened to the barber shop. If you did it 5 years ago, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Why did you start it? Barber shop was started because we believed that we needed to create... No, 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 no. Don't give me this corporate stuff. No, but it's the truth. In the gut. I don't want your head, I want your heart. Why did you start it? What told you that this is the time to do it? Why not one month before? Why not six months later? We're, we're looking for luck. We're not looking for rational. I felt it was time for... I felt it was time for us to take a serious step change in our brand investments and for me to do in public what I used to do in private. I felt, I, was, I felt that we had reached an inflection point on my LinkedIn profile, yeah. on our media spend, etc. for this all to come together publicly. Okay. That's the internal part. Why do you think the world was ready to receive it? What made you so sure? Why did you not do it six months ago? I had not thought of it six months ago. Okay. I, I, I was not, I was Why did you postpone it? Why didn't I postpone it? Yeah. No, but the moment there's a good idea, I'm impatient, right? So, yeah. the moment the idea came, I discussed yeah. with, I think, you and a couple of more yeah. people. People said, this is nice, let's do it. And yeah. the cost of doing it was very low. So, yeah. I just went ahead and did it. Yeah. But it's Actually, you've not yeah. thought about it. Yeah, so much. the timing of it is luck. Correct. So, this is the third yeah. type of luck. That when you see an opportunity... An opportunity knocks very softly on your door sometimes. You heard it. And you didn't start this five years ago. And you've been doing performance marketing, Courageous. new age marketing, built a brand digitally against all odds, against a Goliath of a competitor over a five-year period. But you never did this even though you had the skill. Because there is something that told you or that this is the time. So this is the time to start it. Something inside. That's why I said, don't give me the corporate stuff. Because something told you, this is the time. Wow. I need to do it now. It's called timing luck. And so timing luck doesn't come, you know, a lot of people say, Uska timing, bahut sahi tha. timing luck doesn't come by timing luck. It comes by knowing that I need to do this now. And if I don't do this now, I'll miss the... So the whole of India, as I say, is in a timing luck <laughs> yeah. right now that this is the window. The yeah. next 10 years belongs to our country. Wow. And and how do we get there? So so this is the third type of luck. I love what you said that sometimes opportunity knocks, but it knocks softly. Yeah. And you have to hear it. That is such a powerful yeah. thing. Yeah. And people mistake this for luck. They say the timing was right. So now maybe it will, maybe it will not. There is some other founder who runs some other D2C company in some other space who has a fair enough LinkedIn. I don't know who this profile of this person is, and starts something else like this. They missed the window. Yeah. You took the window. Yeah. So you're lucky or you're first or you know, whatever you where you think of it. So that is incredible luck. And that's also again when you when you evaluate and see that you started this, you had a way of starting it. You know, a big corporate like Colgate came and invested in you. Yeah. And you were on a certain role. Uh and I won't say what nailed it, but I'll tell you at some point of time. Huh. But there was this element of being in the right time and the right I space. Please. The company was in the right mode where you wanted to expand from just being a male grooming yeah. brand to more to having a services business. So that that was a timing luck that was there, yeah. right? My luck in that was I had seen enough cases like this to to be able to spot that this company can do this. Yeah, it was luck, but it was a created luck. Now the final type of luck which is really coming your way, which almost no one has. You're the only one who does this. How many applications did you get after you had the first episode? Almost four digits. Almost four digits. Now, some people call it luck. The person had this, they put up the first episode and got four digits. But the reason it's, 
this fourth luck happens and this is very difficult to maybe put a name to it or whatever it is is that you're the only person who does this there's no one else who does this yeah and that's why you have four digits of applications probably more than anything else like if if you were to set up a vc if you were not to do this in a public forum you know putting it up on youtube and you set up a vc silently and say hey boss i'm setting up a vc you're not getting four digits of deal flow oh for sure for coming, years coming in in a week for sure right for sure so can you see how all these things added up the four you know like you had a zip code you got educated yeah. you went to a firm you learned a lot of skills you built a network you came here you got people to invest in in you a whole set of people then then you went to the next one uh where you were able to hustle and build yourself to a certain place which gave you the freedom to be able to do this because of the wonderful team you built around yourself it's luck but it's not luck and then timing and and then you came to the timing luck because something inside you or you plus your team because of the intelligence the accumulative accumulated learning and wisdom that you've built no data can tell you this that this is the time we start this youtube thing yeah you started it and then now you're the only person doing it and maybe someone will come maybe you'll have competition you know that's life but the but, world is ready but you've got the fourth the world is ready so everyone comes to you right uh, or comes to the show and that's the fourth type of luck now this is something which is difficult to figure out yeah but you can make your own luck and i think you know that's i never thought this was possible man you know even as like 5 years ago or 6 years ago really i never thought this was possible i was like it's luck luck can be good and luck can be bad there yeah. only two types luck of luck luck is not in our hands luck is not in my hand or you know luck is not there and then over time you learn that you can actually hack luck. your way through luck and you can game your way through luck if you are very clear what you want to do or where you want to get or if you have expertise in a certain field and only you have a skill stack which no one else has and then you land up in this unique position where luck seeks you out and yes. where deal seek you out or if you think of you saying like some of the best investor let's say let's take a reed hoffman everyone will come to him yeah he has a track record right so there is no other investor like him and people would kill to have him on the cap table they would just give the shares for free so that they can say it but he's built that over years so so it's the it's the same thing so then you come to other intangible skills does the person have hustle now because that's a form of luck it <clears throat> leads to luck yeah does the person have so much knowledge in a field more than you that's why you hire people better than you yeah that when opportunity knocks you won't hear it but they will wow but they will usually need funding so they, that's why you always tell them that yeah. there is no good idea which doesn't get funded yeah and then obviously the last one because if they're expert and then they become number one in their fields then people will come to them so and world is ready yeah so so it's evolving uh, you, it's very From difficult from the himmat to yeah. himmat and uh, yeah. or card framework to this but i also this think is very very yeah. very but i also think all these frameworks build on each other over time sometimes you can go back and look you know because at the end of the day we are human beings we are not predictable creatures we are contextual creatures and there has to be a context around us for us to perform or not perform uh, and there are many many factors so we are not binary mathematical equations to be solved correct uh, and you learn a little uh. bit more and and you layer it and layer it and make it more sophisticated over time and in some situations this is a great model to have but in some situations you just need to go back good or bad yeah right would i trust the person or would i not trust the person because you know it's as simple as that so you need to learn to play with the frameworks or apply them or use different ones at different times uh, but it is always evolving and you are always learning that's amazing tell me one thing have you seen people who index very high on both competence and luck and by luck it could be manufactured by themselves and sometimes external but hmm. they are amazing at some time in their career and then they are not so amazing at other times where you have had to take the tough call of either letting them go or kind of not working with them anymore in some shape or form do you think this is something that keeps compounding or do you think it's an up and down journey as people progress through professional life uh, if you may it's an up and down journey it is yeah it's an up and down journey uh, no oh. journey is like this in life uh, even if it seems uh, and you know what you said it's very oh. unfortunate but you have to do it from time to time and that i think that you, 
usually happens because the world is a changing and dynamic place and the scale of your company i think we've talked about this yeah. is a changing and dynamic place there is going to come a day when you're not going to be competent to run this company yeah if it if it goes way beyond everyone's dreams and yeah. hopes and becomes uh, you know really big you will be the wrong person to sit in the seat that you're sitting in today yeah and you have to realize that and you know at a certain point of time i'm going to be the wrong person to be sitting in the seats that i sit on nowadays and i'm very well acutely aware of that yeah yeah you have to be aware of it and you have to make peace with it how do you realize this do you do you count on someone to tell you that hey like for example take my trick take my case and you you've told me this multiple times before that founders are generally great zero to one people right they will have a vision they will hire an initial team mm-hmm. they will have extremely high ability to ignore criticism and do things mm-hmm. which they believe in strongly so they're great zero to one but few of them can become good 1 to 10 mm. which is post launch and so mm. on then 10 to 100 which is growth mm. and 100 to 1000 which is hyper scale mm. few founder like zuckerberg mm. for example or mr narayan murthy for example mm. can go from 0 to 1000 yeah most founders kind of realize at some point that they are not the best to be at the helm yeah. they may be the best to do certain things in the company for example right. in my case I might actually be the best to be the creative head of Bombay Shaving Company, running barber shop mm. and ten other ideas, and helping, uh, you know, a CEO with, with, mm. with support and just the separation of ownership and management in my mind and mm. the board's mind might be an interesting thing. But how do you know what the triggers are? So this is a founder context, but also yeah. you are a, you know, you run a multi-billion dollar business. So in your context, what is it like and so on? Yeah. Uh, I think the same founder can't scale through even if you talk about the people that you talked about. But you can change yourself to be the person who needs to run that scale of operation. Oh is it? But you have to change yourself. Because every time your institution or company or organization scales up, you need to scale yourself and change yourself. Every time. And the next version of you always has to be a better version of you. if you want to run a bigger better business and that's why continuous learning continuously questioning yourself having a curiosity these are very important skills to keep adopting and even after that there's a probability that you may not you may not scale the way the company scales or the way way it needs to go but do you lose for example when you go from 1 to 10 or 10 to 100 hmm. do you lose what made you 0 to 10 in the belief of running like a Slight, you know, a moderately sized business. Do you lose what actually made you special as a founder or as a founding member? Hmm. And then that's a far bigger cost yeah. than adapting to a new reality. It I depends. don't know. Yeah, you. it depends. Like sometimes you need to lose it, um, but you know, I mean, I can give you two two uh, sayings for this. One is that you can't make an omelet if you don't break the egg, right? So you have to break the egg to make the omelet. Yeah. Uh, or a caterpillar turning into a butterfly is not a very pleasant process for the yeah. caterpillar it's a very very painful process uh, but what comes out of it is uh, you know a completely transformed uh, being uh, yeah so so you have to transform yourself sometimes it's painful sometimes you don't want to leave it behind and sometimes you say hey listen i don't want to be that person i don't want to do that yeah and i i i rather like this and i want to focus on this and i want to go go in this direction or as that scales i think this is the role i can play and for all this stuff i need to get someone else because i am not that person or i don't want to be that person and it's a personal choice yeah so if you want to scale you scale or if you don't so i'll, I'll give you a very interesting practice uh, that at the end of every year you should fire yourself before anyone can really yeah you fire say you fire yourself at the end of the year and say that the next stage of the company so maybe you're thinking of i'm going to grow at 20% yeah. and you think the next stage it needs a doubling so you deserve to be fired then because you're yeah. not going to you're not going to hit the targets so you try and imagine what is actually needed and if you continue doing what you're doing or if you are incremental on what you're doing then you're the wrong person yeah that forces you to ask what is it that i need to develop or what is the next version of me that i need to develop into to be the best ceo of this business to be the best ceo for this business and therefore what do i need to leave behind am i comfortable leaving that behind am i comfortable giving this away to someone else and do i have it in me to learn that new thing 
or to change myself or to be a better CEO, I need to do this. And that's the question that you need to ask yourself. So I always say it's better to fire yourself before someone else fires you <laughs> and to figure out what is needed for the next stage. Because be hard, yeah. if you keep doing what you're doing, you will you will just become a slightly incremental version of yourself over time. Have you seen, and you've obviously worked with like a multitude of CEOs and founders. Mm-hmm. Have you seen, like who's, who are some of the best in terms of just adapting to very growing scales of business, growing scales yeah. of responsibility, complexity of the business and so on? Yeah, I, I think you can see any of the big tech companies, people who scaled from almost nothing and you can take the big four. Uh, you know, you can take the case of an Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, Google, Meta. Uh, Meta, some of them scaled, like let's say Zuckerberg has scaled uh, himself, you know, from being in a dorm room to running the company. He's still only 36. He's still only 36. That's but crazy. He did get Sheryl Sandberg because yeah. I think he figured out that, you know, we need to divide the response. He remained the CEO, but they divided the responsibilities amongst themselves in a certain way. And they also, incidentally, at least, I'm. this is me applying my framework. Obviously, it may or may not be correct, but I, I see them as a Batman and Robin team. Yeah. Uh, Who's Batman there? can be anyone. You know, that, <laughs> that is the most irrelevant part of it. <laughs> that's the most, I'm it's about, to like, it's like complementary <laughs> skills, right? That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's the bigger picture. Uh, if you see the, if you see the case of uh, Google, at some point of time, they realized they want an external CEO. Very, know, early. Uh, very early. Very early. But they realized it. Yeah. Uh, or they plus the VC realized, who, who knows what happened in the, behind the closed doors, right? Uh, but they realized it and they let they let go of that role at a certain point of time. Yeah. But at a certain point of time, both of them were meeting every person they hired. Right? Wow. I have a friend who was interviewed by them and I was shocked when the person told me that, but uh, he told me they interview everyone they hire. Every person who's hired, like management trainee, they were interviewing. That is insane. Yeah. By the way, till till uh, my part of the organization reached a certain scale, I was interviewing almost everyone at a certain level and above. Now I don't do it anymore, but I try to it. I try to emulate that. Uh, then let's go to the next case, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, I mean he saw the company to till it became a trillion. Yeah, and uh, actually I, I don't know whether I should say it or not, but a lot of our friends in Amazon say that we have not lost a CEO. Now we have two CEOs in the in the company. Really? Yeah, because he's still involved. I mean, he's still pretty involved. He's not uh, completely let go uh, and, of what's there. Yeah, when you want 15% of yeah. what and then million dollar business. Yeah, but, but look at the scale. But I'm yeah. sure that the person, uh, you know, who, who started driving and figuring out the name of the company while driving uh, and selling books as a starting point, he's not the same person yeah. that he was 25, 30, whenever, uh, you know, whenever they started up. Do these things. And then look at Apple. Look at the yeah. other case. Where Steve Jobs came, took the level, and then he was the completely wrong CEO, and his own CEO oh. threw him out of the company, and his board threw him out of the company, yeah. and then he went and learned, and then he came back, yeah. and then he came back as the right CEO for the. So all four companies, four of the biggest companies in the world, they all had different paths, but they're all founder companies. Yeah, and and you know some scaled, some didn't scale, some had to leave, some had to come back. So there's no one answer. But you have to change and grow with the company and you have to scale yourself with the company is definitely important. Tell me one thing. Um, do you think this pressure of, especially in hyperscaling situations like Bezos hmm. or Elon Musk or, you know, so in the India context, if you see some of the unicorns and so on, do you see these guys going through all of this change so quickly the lifestyles changing very quickly, their importance changing quickly, meeting heads of state, prime ministers, mm. presidents, and so on, that they become almost extremely difficult people to be around from a family standpoint, because a lot of them have broken families and mm. all of that. So, is, is that a is that a toll that you think this process takes on the average human being, or is it just? A coincidence as... Uh, no, it can. It, it depends how, how you go. You know, as uh, Michael Jordan famously says, leadership has a price. Right? It has a price. You have to be all in. You have to be fully on. You have to be fully present when you're there. Uh, so it has a price to pay. If you are excelling in something and spending a lot of time on something, by definition, you're spending less time on other stuff. Yeah. And it's a choice that you make. It doesn't have to be and you don't have to end up with yeah. Broken, and at some point you may say that's a priority, and this is not a priority. Like a lot of people throw it in and say, now 
have decided you know that's the priority as as uh, again as confucius says that uh, you have only two lives right you heard this no you have only two lives the second one starts the moment you realize you have only one wow, wow. so there's a point of time where you realize that you actually only have one life to live and you decide how am i going to live it and what's my priority in the you know there is only there are two things sure i think is been discussed in the earlier one death and taxes yeah so we are all both our hardware and software yeah is designed to to terminate yes at some point of time yes i think we have solved a lot of the software problems through medicine we have not solved the hardware problem because we've hit a wall on the hardware yeah the hardware decays and dies dies at some point of time but if you realize that that's there then you think about it in a different way amazing it takes us to a more philosophical bent of the conversation right i think think about it i, I wanted to ask you this and i always ask people who mm. have expatriate lives you know mm. in a way like kind of all over the world south korea china india mm. london now it's so on mm. right tell me about family for you and mm. i know you're close to your parents i know that you know you're rooted Mm. in a way in india and you're at an age where uh, you know your kids are growing older but so are your parents so mm. you know you look up as much as you look down in fact maybe more now mm. as you grow older um but tell me about arjun the the uh, the family guy and what 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 home means for you mm. there are two homes okay. right uh, one home is the home that you live in when you are abroad uh with your nuclear family and the other home certainly is when you come back and stay with your parents where you grew up where you may or may not have grown up because your parents may have moved to a different house but sometimes the, but you grew family. up from a vibe point of view from an atmosphere point of view certainly from a food point of view yeah. because <laughs> you know you always want to go back and uh, have your home cooked food correct um and i i think you just need to find a way to make both work yeah and mix both uh as much as you can so uh and over time if you if you are out there wrong enough everyone develops their own system uh i'll give you my lottery ticket number but it certainly will not work for everyone yeah uh so you, you know there are some some very very basic things like and it has to be tactical but it adds up to you know some kind of a big strategy uh, you know which is you know try to be there for the right times or the right moments So for example very rarely maybe once a year and i have a lot of travel if you have a traveling job even if you are an expat you are back home for the weekend yeah you don't miss a holiday whatever happens maybe you'll ask me this question later on i was speaking to megna so she said you have to tell shantanu how you plan holidays <coughs> at some point of time uh um, but you don't miss the holidays and you make sure that's there so one of the things that let's say in keeping the you know being together we all love travel all all three of us love travel we we love going to see new places new countries exploring we may have different things we like in the travel but we all love it so we try and make sure that every chance we get to travel we travel so if there's a long weekend we travel uh, to a new place or a new country or if it was like during the covid times you know do a road trip drive out somewhere stay in an airbnb uh and that actually like i'm planning my 2023 calendar i've already planned uh the first thing that gets blocked in the calendar are the holidays wow <clears throat> and then they are sacred no one can touch it and then a certain number of months at a time you plan out and say this is these are the countries so we would sit together and make a list of these are all the countries we all want to visit then we'll all say this is the top one for me next year and then we will plan a trip there or you know this is the city i want to go to i want to figure out something uh and i think that's one great way of bonding it won't be a surprise that with my son we have a very common interest of technology so that's something how that old is he now he's 12 he just okay. turned 12 uh so so we would bond on 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 that uh spending time obviously with the parents is important so again one of the systems we've developed over the year or i think it's organically is that whichever country we are living in my parents will come and spend at least a couple of months with us 
usually in the summer because it's England and it's you know, no one wants up. to come in the winter. <laughs> uh, and Anjali's parents will also do the same. At different times. At different times. Wow. So you have four. Yeah. We've also done everyone together, but that is tough. I won't recommend <laughs> it because you just don't have the space. Yeah. Uh, but we would have that. So in a way, if you see it, see it like four months of the year, we're yes. with our parents. Wow. Uh, then we come for the holidays to India at least once or twice a year. So half of the year you have five, five months. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think if you you should read this uh, blog, wait but why? I don't know if you read Which it. Which one? Wait, wait but, but why? why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So wait but why has one of the most mind opening things about both as a as a child to your parents, but also as a parent to your child, is that it maps out how you spend time and what percentage of time you would spend. And by the time you are 18 and leave for college, you have spent 95% of the time that you would spend with your parents or your child has spent over a lifetime. Over your lifetime. Fuck. And then you just have 5% left. So that's crazy. So you can change the equation once you know it. So it's the awareness. So once you're aware of this, you do more things. You change the equation. And 5%, it may still be 5%, but the point is they're physically present in the house. Yeah. You're living in the same house for a couple of months a year with your parents and then, you know, with uh, with Anjali's parents, then you come back and you stay. So I think that gives you, and and time is everything in this, right? Uh, so, so spending that time is important and how you build it. Now, as a result, I am not very good at the one degree of separation. I'm very poor at it, actually. Say more. Cousins, oh. uh, one degree away. Uh, in my wife's family, huh. etc. But again, as you know, my focus is deep relationships. Yeah. Uh, so and it should be meaningful. Uh, and the deepest relationship that you have is with your parents and with your siblings and with your spouse, children. Because, yeah. And of course, with your spouse. Your spouse is your partner and everything. So it's like, remember we talked about some of the most important things at work is your boss. Yeah. Right? The two most important things in life, again, having been, in, you know, lived in many countries, which determine almost 99% of what will happen to you is who is your partner and which city do you choose to live in? It will determine everything, your quality of life, health, mental health, everything is related to that. The tensions or the non-tensions or the enjoyment that you have are largely with the city that you choose to live in or you land up in. Sometimes you land up in and sometimes you choose to live in that city. But it drives, if you think back to your life, it drives almost everything uh, that happens, the interaction points of these two things are your personal life. And that enables you or disables you from doing many other things. That is so true. So being mindful of, of that, I mean the single most important thing that you choose in your life is your partner. Yeah. Right? Or, or you are chosen by your partner is probably more like <laughs> it uh, in, in, uh, in our cases. But so again, it's a mix of many, 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 many yeah. little different things that go along, but it's how you build it. And yeah. what do you optimize for yeah. in all of this? So taking yourself away from this boss thing and your partner thing and your, uh, this come back to yourself. What do you want to optimize yourself for? This, you know, I, I picked up from, um, from Nawal Ravi Khan from his book, yeah. but this is really, really stuck with me, uh, is you're optimizing for a calm mind inside a healthy, healthy body, body, inside a home full of love. And then everything else is a bonus. If you can fix these three things, or if you can at least no one gets everything all of the time, but, and a lot of the best things in life or the best problems to solve always come in threes, always come in threes. So this is one of the, you know, three, three, if you can get, if you have a calm mind inside a healthy body, inside a home full of love, what else your do home. you need? Your home. Your home. What, what else? Yeah, wealth and all that, but you can only get wealth and money and all these things if you have these things right. Because if one of these things go wrong, that's gone out of the window. Like if you're mentally disturbed, you won't be able to do anything. Yeah. If you have broken relationships, uh, uh, you, you hinted to some of them, you won't be able to do anything. If you don't have a fit body, at some point of time, your body will give way and run out. So as long as you keep optimizing for these things, the other stuff will work, it, work itself out. The world is a big place. 
is it is it a lot of effort for you to do it or you kind of you have to be super conscious about it conscious you have to be super conscious about it right mm-hmm. you have to decompress you have to force yourself to switch off for your mind um if you have a meditation <coughs> practice you sh- you you know you go through that over time do you meditate yeah from time to time i'm not super regular at it like how people say like you need to do it every morning for certain no but sometimes i say reading is meditation for me yeah uh music is meditation and music yeah. yeah mindfulness you're just focused on 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 the one thing and uh but it's about switching off there is a simple thing like switching off between meetings or taking 5 5 yeah. minutes that itself is walking can be meditation <coughs> without anything so walking the dog is meditation for me uh because you have to be incredible you know the most present the most present uh person in our house is is our dog is always present yeah right there's no past or or there's no past or future for the dog yeah. it's yeah. now everything is here now. and now and amazing if you're, right if you're with the dog and if you're walking with the dog you have to be here and now yeah. because you <laughs> know the, the dog will run away here the guy will <laughs> run away there you know you have to keep a really eye. so so you can you know you get there and and then you have to build fitness and so after holidays the next thing which is put in is and there you have to find a way to keep yourself honest people have different ways some people go to the gym my way of keeping myself honest is to have a person uh, a personal trainer who will do it and make sure that you do it on a regular basis uh-huh. and that is after the holidays the next appointment that goes into the calendar <laughs> is the fitness is the fitness and the personal trainer yeah and that no one no one can take that slot um uh, and then for the last one uh when it comes to home what's the spelling of love L O V T I M E It's not L O V So T I M E is the spelling of love at home you have to give time there is no substitute and I don't think I'm really good at it I need to improve uh we all need to because we are like super involved in what we do but that is super important this is the starting point you can't have L O V if you don't have T I M E and you have to first optimize for time and get to love incredible incredible has we i think wrap up for today um arjun this has been a uh deeply riveting uh, conversation i know we 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 get along and we always have great conversations but today has been extra special because i think we went quite deep on a certain set of topics but before we end some words of reflection advice for people who are people who are listening to us are possibly people who love the startup ecosystem we vicariously are living the founder dream by watching other founders and so on but maybe one day want to become founders hmm. are actually founders themselves and are looking for validation in some shape or form or are people working at startups in some shape or form right so that's the <coughs> audience hmm. any um any words of uh, advice reflection probing thoughtfulness to them before we wrap up for today you can go out and say don't be afraid of failing or what are you afraid of and you must do a fear setting exercise like what's the worst that can happen to me if yeah. i do this uh and a lot of times when you do that fear setting exercise you get up, you, you know first of all you figure out that your fear is unfounded or it's something that happened to your childhood which is connected to why you have that fear yeah. usually you, you if you if you introspect deep enough you will find so that uh and a lot of times it's they you have no re- reason to fear but i i think the second thing in instead of telling people to you know fool hardly chase your dreams do what you love of course you must do all that but i think no one or very few people tell you that backstop yourself how do you protect yourself from failure or how do you give yourself a certain amount of time how do you not make it a bet which will make you bust and bankrupt and completely destroy you yeah. and as long as you don't do that and you protect yourself against that you can fall down and start again you can fall down and start many times again yeah uh and and actually whether it's a startup founder whether it's a person working in a medium sized company whether it's a person working in a big company whether it's a person not working in a company and trying to do something else which may not have a wealth or money motive behind it or doing the right thing or 
you know, picking a cause and, and fighting for it. I think <coughs> balance is important. Two things I would say actually. Balance is important and things work in cycles. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes the time is right and sometimes your timing is not right. Yeah. But realize that things work in cycles. So if something is really bad, it will get better. It will get better at some point of time. And balance yourself. Make sure that you don't have a destroy yourself risk to it. And then, you know, you can fail. Yeah. And by the way, people who are investing in your company are very well aware in the beginning that they have a 93%, hopefully, <laughs> chance of failure. Yeah. Uh, so, so they're also going in with, with their eyes open. And we all love second time founders and third time founders. <laughs> and a lot of times they have failed first two yeah. times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. So, you know, no matter how difficult it is, uh, you know, it will get better. And there is a very famous saying in Brazil. Uh, and you know, love the Brazilians for some of the stuff they come up with. It's just amazing. Uh, and I've learned this from a lot of Brazilian people that I've worked with. Is that, it's very simple. In the end, everything will be okay. If it's not okay, it's not the end. So wow. that would be the last thing that I would like to leave everyone with. Thank you, Arjun. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on The Barbershop. No, thank you so much for having me. Amazing.